in a series called Selfless. And um, the reason why we have this is because uh, February is called the uh, Love Month. It's a relation, relationships are front and center in people's lives, and people are um, so, I guess a lot of people are in love. And in fact, maybe the person seated right next to you looks someone who is in love. Anyone seated beside someone who looks like in love? Okay, any one of you here who's seated beside someone who seems to need love desperately? Okay, all right. And so the reason why we have this series is so that we can um, understand what the Bible says about relationships because we want our relationships to flourish, right? We want to have good relationships, whether it be in the family or in the community, in your school or in your offices. We hope and we are praying that we would grow to have good relationships. And so one of the main reasons, one of the main keys for us to have good relationships in all aspects of our lives is to have a selfless mentality. And so we are um, dissecting this word through the lens of Ephesians. And as we look at the book of Ephesians, we are learning what it means to live a selfless life, to relate with people selflessly. Last week, we talked about um, uh, the key to that, the key to having a selfless kind of love is when you experience a selfless love of Christ. And so if you were not here last week, we hope that you download the podcast or other preaching or other pastors preached powerfully last week and we do hope that you would um, listen to them. Now, um, today we're going to be talking about one of the critical relationships that we have, especially for those of you who are in this state or status. I'm talking about marriage, okay? And so if you are here, you are married, please lift up your hand. Great, okay? Most of us here are married. If you are here, you want to be married someday, please lift up your hand too. If you are here and no matter what we ask, you will never lift up your hand, please lift up your hand too. Okay, so. And so most of us here are married and some of us here, we are aspiring, we're dreaming um, of one day getting married. Um, or maybe you just came from marriage and you are here seeking for healing. You know, this message is for you. Um, for those of us who are in this situation or in this state or status being uh, having a spouse of our own, we hope that the principles that we will learn here, you will apply in your marriage. For those of you who are not yet married, but you aspire, you dream, you pray to God that you will one day, you know what? The principles that we will look into here, I hope will give you a picture of what you're going to expect in marriage. Or if you do have expectations in marriage, I hope that somehow this will bring greater clarity. For some of us who are kind of, you know, um, from a relationship and, you know, not, um, it didn't end well, you know what? This is also good for you because this will in a way, help you understand the heart of Christ in what you're going through at this time. For those of us who don't believe in marriage at all, well, I believe that this is also for you because somehow, these things that we're going to be looking at today will, again, clarify. Maybe there are things that uh, were spoken to us or things that we've observed that somehow made a distortion of our understanding of this concept, and I hope that this will bring clarity to that as well. You know, if we look at um, statistics nowadays, I found this uh, from uh, PSA or Philippine Statistics Authority. From 2005 all the way to 2015, they say that even though our population is increasing year after year, even though a lot of people are maturing or growing up, less and less people are getting married. Less and less people are entering into a contract, a covenant with another human being or a person a man and a woman, you know, to enter into marriage. How can it be? How can it be? How is that so? Could it be that people somehow now have a blurred understanding of marriage and that is why they think it's just a paper, it's just a piece of paper, or it's, something, it's like a big rock that you're going to hit your head with, or perhaps because of circumstances that have happened in the past for them, or even the people around them, they choose not to enter into this relationship. In fact, if you would look at the world out there, how they define marriage, you would be surprised at how they would define this thing called marriage. One comedian put it this way, okay? Chris Rock, I don't know if you know him, he said, you could be married and bored or single and lonely. Ain't no happiness nowhere. What a sad life for a comedian, okay? He had a very sad perspective of life. But then that's somehow true, isn't it? Somehow this world thinks that if you are single, 
you're lonely. And if you are married, you can end up bored because you're just with that one person for the rest of your life. I mean, that is the perspective of the world. No wonder why people nowadays here in the Philippines, and I believe even across the other nations, somehow they think something is wrong with marriage. That they don't want to get married, or if they are married, the solution is to get unmarried, or if they want to, I guess, have the benefits of marriage without the, the responsibilities of it, why don't we just get into a live-in kind of a relationship. See, it is important that we have a biblical understanding of marriage so that, so that our perspective of this will be cleared up and also the way we live this, if you are in it or if you will be one day, would somehow be aligned with what the Scripture is saying. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you from Ephesians chapter 5, and hopefully we can define what does the Bible say about marriage. Now, perhaps you already know this, and this may be a refresher, good, but if you don't know what the Bible says about marriage, it is good for us to look at what God's design is for marriage. Our text for today will be in Ephesians chapter 5, and so if you have your Bibles with you, open it to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll be reading from verse 17 onwards. And so if you, please, uh, if, you, if you could please stand with me as we read the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. It says here, Therefore, do not be foolish, foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with, with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loved his wife love, loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Finally, in verse 31, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the word of God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. Lord, we thank you for Ephesians. We thank you, Lord, for these words that were written. These were words. These are words not written by man, but you inspired the Apostle Paul to write this letter. Even in this paragraph, Lord God, or these paragraphs that we are trying to understand today, these are your words. And Father, we pray. Holy Spirit, we ask. Lord, illuminate our minds, Lord God. Illuminate the scriptures for us so that we would reveal Lord, the truths, behind, the truths behind it will be revealed to us. Father, thank you. These principles, these truths, Lord God, may it be engraved in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. May you take your seats? Now, that is the text that we're going to be dissecting today. And if you were not here last week, I mentioned that the book of Ephesians is to give us context the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, and he wrote this to a group of believers in Ephesus so that they would be guided how they can live their lives. So the context of this is it was written to those who say that they are believers of Jesus Christ. They are Christians, like uh, most, if not all of us here, claim to be. And so Paul, in, verse, or in chapters 1 to 3, he was explaining um, who Christ is, and then in the latter part, is explaining or sharing how that translates to our daily lives. 
In fact, he was, in a way, um, highlighting relationships in chapters 3 or chapters 4 all the way to 6, whether it be in the church, whether it be with one another, and now in chapter 5, which is at the core or the center of uh, 4, 5, and 6, is highlighting one of the most important relationships of all, which is marriage. What is marriage? Last uh, Friday, I was talking to a couple um, with, um, they gave me a, the privilege of officiating their marriage or their wedding this coming March 4. And I was so surprised. I was so happy to hear about their love story. And I was so, um, you know, I guess blessed to hear about their testimony. But then, like most couples that I interview, I asked them a set of questions so that I would know who they are and so that I could explain what marriage entails and is all about. And so today, I'm going to share with you as well three principles or three truths from the scripture that we've read about what marriage is all about. Three truths about marriage, and the first one is this. Marriage is sacred. Can you say sacred? sacred. Marriage in the eyes of God is holy. Marriage in the eyes of the Bible or in the, the lens of the Bible is special. It is sacred before our God. Now, why is it so? Okay, verse 31. We're going to be reading from 31, and then we're going to be reading backwards to see what the Bible says about marriage. Verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What is interesting about the scripture is this was a direct quotation of the Apostle Paul of the very first human activity that ever happened in recorded history or in the Bible. And that is in Genesis chapter 2 when Adam and Eve got married. They were the, that's the first wedding that happened in human history. In fact, in Genesis 2.24, 2, it says there, same thing. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and, his, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so, if you remember, how many of you are familiar with the story of Adam and Eve? Okay, for those of you who don't, if you read Genesis, you will find there that after God creating everything, um, the earth and everything that is in it, on the sixth day of creation, God creates man. After fashioning man, Adam, from uh, dust and breathing life into him, he became a human being. He became Adam. And so he placed him in a garden called Garden of Eden, and he, he was in charge of the garden. But at that time, as Adam was you know, making sure that everything is working in the Garden of Eden, God saw something missing in the life of Adam. And in fact, he said, it is not good for this man to be alone. It is not good for a man or for man to be alone. I will create a helper suitable for him. And so what happened was, um, Adam or God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, God took one of Adam's ribs and fashioned it and spoke life to it or breathed life to it and become Eve, the woman. And so when Adam woke up from his sleep, okay, of course, God is so, I'm, I, I'm imagining, does, does Adam have a scar here or something? Okay, but um, when he woke up, one thing that the Bible says is when he woke up, wow, he was already in a wedding ceremony. Okay, he was there in front of the altar. Okay, I guess just imagine me with me. Okay. He was there in front of the altar, and as he was waking up, lo and behold, there's this woman approaching her. By the way, do you know why the woman is called woman? Huh? Why? You know, because the first time Adam saw Eve, he said, Whoa! Man! He was so enamored. He was so... Of course, that's not what the Bible says. Okay, that's just a pastor's reading into Scripture. But he was so enamored. He was, caught, he was love-struck at that time. Love at first sight with this woman. And so, did you know that the very first father of the bride was actually God. And I can imagine God walking Eve towards Adam and presenting Eve to Adam and say, this is your wife. One of my favorite parts in a wedding is when the parents would give away the bride, especially the dad. I love looking at the dads during that moment. Any of you, you have a daughter Okay, many of you here, I mean, I'm sure you can relate or maybe you know the feeling because you already did this. But 
I can see from all, or I saw from all of those dads who would give away, either they're crying, tears of joy, or they're really mad at the guy, okay, who's going to get their daughter. Okay? Because it's painful for a dad to leave their daughter or give their daughter, perhaps, in marriage to, another, to a stranger. But yet, here's God, woman, surprise daughter, giving to Adam. And so, we can see there that the idea of marriage was actually not man's idea. It was God's idea. It was God initiated. It was God ordained. And it's meant to be God sustained. That is God's idea for marriage. It is so special to Him. It is so holy. It's not just a contract. It's a covenant. It is something deeper than a piece of paper. It means more than a piece of paper. It is an eternal or a, a forever kind of, co of covenant. That is what marriage is. In fact, Jesus so, um, I guess, um, wanting to emphasize the point that marriage is special, even said this, okay? Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and will pass his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is what happened when some of the Pharisees were having an argument with him about divorce. Verse 6, Jesus expands the statement. He said, so there are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. What is the point here? God values marriage. God values marriage. It is sacred in the eyes of God. Can you imagine if you look at the Bible in Genesis, the first human activity, human recorded, first activity was a wedding. If you look in Revelation, the last thing that we would do as a humankind is also a wedding. It's the wedding of the church and Jesus Christ. Do you remember the very first miracle that Jesus did? It happened as well in a as if he was shouting to us today. As if he was emphasizing today, if you look at my scripture, my sons and my daughters, I treasure marriages. I value marriages. Why, God? Why do you think God would value marriages like that? If you look at the scripture, you'll be able to conclude this. God values marriage because a marriage is the closest picture of the kind of relationship God wants us to have with Him and Him towards us. By design, a marriage is supposed to be a picture of the kind of commitment, the kind of devotion, the kind of exclusivity, the kind of love that God has for us and us supposed to be towards Him. That is why God values marriages. See, generations past, I believe one of the main targets of the enemy are marriages. One of those that the enemy has a big bull's eye on are those who are married. Why? Because he knows if he messes up this marriage, Somehow, the people around them, their perspective of who God is would be blurred. If you are here, maybe you know of some people who don't believe in God. And when you look at why that is so, could it be that one of the main reasons is because they don't have good examples in terms of marriage. And somehow, they've been affected with what happened you know, to the relatives or what happened you know, to the people around them, that's why they don't want to relate with God. See, the picture of marriage is the closest picture of the, of the kind of love and relationship that God has for us. In fact, John Piper put it this way. Marriage is for the display of God's covenant keeping grace. Marriage, the ultimate purpose of a marriage, it's not procreation, it's not everything else. It is to display God's covenant keeping grace see people enter into marriage for different reasons um, I want to make a confession personally when I entered into marriage one of my main reasons was improvement of race and so I want my genes to be improved okay so I married a very beautiful and a very smart woman okay why do I know that she's very smart 
because she said yes to me. Okay? <laughs> no, that's just kidding. But some people, they marry for financial gain. Some people for political reasons. Some people for other factors. But yet, hear from Scripture, and I want to share it with you. God's idea for marriage is for your marriage to be a picture of God's grace being kept and being shared. In other words, your marriage exists for the glory of God. It's to honor God. So my prayer for those of you who are in marriage, my prayer is that God will give you the grace for your marriage to be God-honoring. It may be turbulent at this time. Some of you here, you have turbulent marriages at this time. But I am claiming, I am believing with you one day. This will all end well. All things will work together for your good. One day, one day, you will see the answers to the prayers that you're praying, praying for. See, the prayer uh, or this, this, the power of marriage, if you understand that it is sacred and it is holy, if you understand that this purpose of this marriage is to bring honor to God, and if you believe in it, it has a huge, huge power that can affect your marriage. In fact, I like how one pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, put, put it. It is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. See, we can fall in love, but sometimes we can also fall out of love. But then here we see, if you know that the purpose of marriage is more than anything, it's for God's glory and honor, that will give you the grace in times that you are, have fallen out of love for that marriage to sustain and re-energize, reinvigorate, resuscitate even that love. That is the power of understanding that marriage is a sacred covenant before God. Point number two is marriage is about selflessness. By design, God intends marriages to be a showcase of selflessness. Okay? Just to prove a point, verse 22, again, as we move back. It says here, wives and all the men say, all right. We have very submissive husbands in the house, okay? Okay? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, okay? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. To, when you say to submit, it means to obey. When you say to submit, it means to subordinate yourself. When you say to submit, it means to yield. It means to be under the command of. It is the voluntary giving of yourself or giving in or cooperating so that you can accomplish a certain Goal. That's what the Bible says about submit. Now, all of the married women in the house would say, and I believe would say, that is difficult, isn't it? Oh, it's hard. Or is it easy? I mean, how, I mean, I, I'm just looking at from a, my man's perspective, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to submit, okay? In fact, I remember a conversation of a, a pastor and a woman um, this married woman said, Pastor, do I really have to obey the scripture? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And the pastor asked, why? Why do you ask this question? Because the woman said, you know, because, you know, if I have to obey and I have to submit to him, how can that be? I am richer than this guy. I earn more than this man. I am way smarter than this guy. And the pastor asked the girl, you know, Yes, you're richer, you earn more, and you're more intellectual than this guy. Can I have one question? If you're that smart, why did you marry this guy? <laughs> Submission can be challenging. Of course, we know that submitting to your husband, above that are the legal laws of the land. And so if your husband is calling you to do something illegal, you're not supposed to submit. And higher than that are the moral laws of God. And so if your husband is asking you to violate the moral laws of God, you don't have to submit. But yet, if your husband is lovingly leading you, the Bible is encouraging you, commanding you to submit. But even if that is so, this is still quite hard. Now, before you think that the Bible is disadvantageous towards women or looks less to women, look at what God has to say to the men, okay? Verse 25, husbands, all the women say? Wow, okay. 
Mas malakas yung sa women, ha? okay? So, husbands, love your wives, and here's the clincher. As Christ loved the church and gave himself, himself up for her. Women are called by God to submit, but husbands are called by God to love. And not just any kind of love. God calls the husbands to love as Christ loved the church. And what is that? It's the sacrificial kind of love. It's the willingness to lay down your life kind of love. I am sure all the husbands here, if someone would, if somebody would, you know, um, have an, has a knife and would try to hit or, you know, stab your wife, how many of you husbands, you know, I'm sure all of the husbands are so willing, okay, to put not your wife in front, but your life in front, right? You're willing to put, you sacrifice your life for your wife. And that is, I believe, how most, uh, all of the men here would respond. We'd be willing to lay down our life for our spouses, for our wife. But you know, sometimes it's easier to die for them. But can you live with them? Pastors, saksak na lang, mas madali. God is not just calling us to lay down our life. How about our pride? Are we willing to lay down our pride when we are being corrected and we know that she is right? How about our pleasures? We know that you like to watch the NBA. Are we willing to put down the NBA? How about your priorities, your other priorities, like your job? like some things that, and I'm preaching this to myself as well. Are we willing to lay down our lives in that way? Because God is asking us, as men, as husbands, and as future husbands who are here, God is calling, commanding men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Willingness to sacrifice themselves. Anyone of you here, you've seen the Jollibee commercials online? Uh, Valentine's, yeah? Um, yes, there are several, but I want to show, uh, sh- uh, share with you three. One, uh, three. This was the, 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 the burger, the burger commercial. And this is about uh, those who are loving and uh, those who desire to not give up with love. For those of you who, are, who haven't seen it, um, might want to sh- look at it in YouTube. So far, this is about 12 million views in the past few days. That's how people are in love, okay? or at least looking for love these days. One of those, I mean, I was crying earlier when I saw this, about this uh, video about the date. Maybe some of you also cried when you saw this. But um, another one of that is this one. It's the vow. And so um, what happened was in this commercial, I hope they don't mind sharing a few things about it. Uh, the, the, the commercial began with this guy fixing his barong and he was in front of the altar and he was in a way narrating and saying as if he was saying a vow or his vows to the bride. And so the, the bride enters and then he starts and says, the first time I saw you, I already knew that you're going to spend, I'm, I, I'm, I want to spend the, life, my, the rest of my life with you. And then he starts to narrate the first time they saw each other in Jollibee um, and the first time, the things that they did after that, you know, um, how he would push the car, how would, he would selflessly give up his time and energy for the girl, how he was willing to wait for her, how he's willing to lay down, you know, his uh, uh, preferences for her, how, she would, how he would be patient with the girl. And so at that moment, when they were face to face, he was saying he knew from the very beginning that he would spend the rest of his life with her. And that he desires for her to be happy no matter what. Even if it means he's not going to be with her for the rest of his life. So the story has a twist. Biglang lumabas yung groom. Unfortunately, he was the best man. Okay? But yet he was so happy that in spite of the situation, he still unconditionally loves the girl. I guess that is a picture 
of the kind of love that God is asking men and women to have for each other. Because when you say love and submit, they, have both, uh, they both have a common denominator, and that is being selfless. I like how Pastor Tim Keller put it. The cancer in any marriage, the cancer that kills a marriage is selfishness. Because it is unnatural for a human being to focus or to be concerned of the concerns of others rather than his priorities or her priorities. It is unnatural. It is uncommon. And that is why we need to, as the Bible says, disciple ourselves to be selfless. If you want your marriage to succeed, then God is commanding us be selfless. Because to submit or to love sacrificially is not instinctive, it's not, an, it's not or it's unnatural, but very foundational in any healthy marriage. Now again, the challenge is, this is hard. In fact, we may be asking, possible by yon, pastor? Is that possible? Is that even possible? The Bible gives us a clue in Ephesians chapter 5. In verse, um, in verse 21, we will find that, that the secret to this is because marriage is also sustained by Christ. Marriage, by God's design, is sustained by Christ. What does that mean? Okay? In verse 21, it says there, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another, lay down your life, um, love unconditionally one another out of reverence for Christ. See, when you talk about out of reverence for Christ, it means, um, some, uh, it, in another translation, it means the fear of Christ. But then again, when you look at the word fear, it has a different connotation in our day because to be fearful means to be afraid or to be petrified or terrified with something. But if you would look at the original meaning of this word, it means actually in ESV, got it right, it's reverential awe of who Jesus Christ is. And this is what it means to have a reverential awe of Christ. It means you know what Christ has done for you. You know that you were forgiven by Christ. You know that you are loved unconditionally by Christ and you are overwhelmed with the love that you receive from Christ every single day that you cannot but just overflow with love. The key to having a selfless kind of marriage is to every single day experiencing the love of Christ. You will find this interesting. Did you notice the verses that we've read? How come when Paul was talking about marriage and relationships, how come he would talk about drunkenness? Why would he say and comment about drunkenness prior to verse 21? It says there, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. What Paul is saying here is, you know what? Nothing will be able to fill you to make your relationship with your spouse right. But the Holy Spirit can fill you so that you will have a reverential awe of Christ every day single day God wants us to experience the love of Christ every single day and when we speak of love the Greek um, word has four words for love um, storge um, eros phileo and agape when you say uh, when you say and speak of um, eros it means romantic kind of love and let me just illustrate this by, by doing this one When you say eros, which is the romantic kind of love, suppose these are two people. To be romantically in love with someone is, you will stay in that relationship as long as you're getting something from that relationship. Oh, he's cute, he's nice, he's rich, he provides, he always commends me, he always does these things for me. And so that's why you like to be in that relationship. 
But then, the problem with eros, or romantic kind of love, is if the other person does not have anything else to give, the person walks away from the relationship. Because there's nothing more about that love than just mere, what can I get from that relationship? Phileo is mutual. As long as I'm getting something and you're getting back something, this relationship will strive. But then we all know that that is not the case all the time. At one point in time, one has to give. One person will give way. One person will run out of uh, things to love or things to give. Then comes the other word, agape, which is the kind of love that God is talking about here when we look at Ephesians chapter 5. Agape means, I'm going to give no matter if it's not reciprocated. I am going to submit no matter if I am not loved. I am going to love no matter if I'm not respected. I am going to love no matter if it's unnoticed. I'm going to love even if, even if, and even if. See, that is why a lot of people as well a lot of people quit on love and they say, Pastor, it's because I have nothing more to give. Love is so demanding. Love is so hard, it's such a hard work that it ate everything inside of me. While that is true, what the Bible is talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 is introducing to us agape kind of love, but you have to understand there is a source. In fact, being filled with the Spirit or being filled with God or being filled with the reverential awe of God, it means if this is Christ and He has abundant love for you, it's being filled every morning when you wake up, when you read this Bible, when you pray. Somehow, when you worship, God fills you to overflowing. Somehow, you're overflowing that even if your spouse is mad at you and somehow withdraws from your account, or somehow he's, he or she says something that you don't like, and somehow you feel like you get depleted, and when everything is done at the end of the day, somehow you feel you are depleted of love, guess what? The love of Christ is there for you every day, and you can be filled every single day to overflowing. And it happens every day. It happens every morning you wake up. The unfathom, unfathomable, the unending love of God is available for us every single day. My hope and my prayer is that all of us would learn to tap on that love every single day so that we would have a relationship, not just in a marriage, but relationships wherein we can love unconditionally because we are loved unconditionally by our God. As I close, I want to share with you this story. This is the story of, um, remember the couple I mentioned to you earlier that I'm going to officiate their wedding on March 4. And I asked permission if I could share this love story to you all today. And they gladly um, gave me the permission to do so. And so this is the couple. Uh, this is Ace, the guy, and the girl is Shet. And they've known each other for more than a decade now. In fact, they say that uh, they've been in a relationship or they've, uh, they started their relationship or love story 11 years ago. And so they were in love with each other. Um, I think it's after graduation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they became boyfriend and girlfriend. But because they love one another and because they don't know Christ yet at that time, they decided to, instead of getting married, they decided to live in together. And so they were together, cohabitating for uh, five years. But, the end, but at the end of those five years, they said, because of circumstances and because of some arguments and because of things not being met, somehow they decided to call it off. They broke up the relationship. And at that moment, I remember them saying, that was one of the hardest decisions that they, they ever made. And that was one of the most painful situations that they've ever been. In fact, they both felt very empty at that time. It was during that time that one of the friends of the girl, um, Shep, invited her to church. 
and somehow introduced Jesus to her. And it so happened that in, um, in one of the preachings that she attended, um, the preaching is about relationships and how relationships in general will not fill you. Only God's relationship with you can fully complete you. She realized that this void in her heart and in her soul is a void that cannot be filled with anything like love or pleasures in life or even, um, you know, um, even money. She realized that that big vacuum in her can only be filled by God. And so on the day that she surrendered her life to Christ, that was the day that she felt that love. Ace also got that experience when, I think it was also Shea who invited um, Ace to church and somehow he also heard that message and when he heard that, he also responded to the love of Christ. They, got both, they both got discipled, both of them and, uh, joined a small group. Um, I think both of them got baptized in 2014. And so after that, they say somehow something changed, a big change happened in their lives. Now they feel complete in Christ. Last year, A said he thought of, I mean, he still likes her. And so he thought of, what if I ask her again? To his shock and maybe to his surprise, she said yes. But the clincher of it all is when I asked them, what is the difference now? They both said, somehow because of Christ, we are not coming into a relationship as empty and lacking and needing completeness. Now, because we have Christ in us, somehow we are complete and we are willing to share our completeness with one another. I believe that is a wow, wonderful picture of what marriages should look like. In fact, I want to honor them. They're here today. She and um, Ace, can you please wave your hand? They're here today. Let's give them a big hand. You know, that is our prayer for all of us. Um, more than getting married, it's first and foremost experiencing that completeness in Christ. That every single day, we would experience the unending the unconditional love of Christ every single day because this is the key to having good relationships this is the key to living selfless lives this is the key to having good marriages amen can we all close our eyes praise God Heavenly Father, we thank you for, thank you, Lord, for today. Can I invite everyone to please stand up? I believe that the Holy Spirit is here and He is ministering. The Bible says His mercies his grace, His love, it is new every morning. And even this day when we woke up, God's mercy, God's grace is new. It's special. It's unique for this day and it's overflowing. And I believe God wants us to be filled once again today with that grace, that mercy, that love and so with all heads bowed all eyes closed can we all please just lift our hands towards heaven as a sign of receiving that grace receiving that love Lord we lift up to you our hands and you know the level of love that we're in right now some of us are half full some of us Lord God are almost empty some of us are already been empty for the past days now but God, Lord, thank you for reminding us we don't have to be empty. We don't have to be half full. Lord, we can be overflowing with your love. God, even as we lift up our hands to you right now, thank you, God, that you love us. Unconditionally, God, Lord, you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you, when you see us, you see Christ in us. And so, God, Lord, today, we receive afresh your love. 
Holy Spirit, right now, in Jesus' name, minister. I pray even now, Lord God, just remove, remove, Lord God, the bitterness. Remove the pains, Lord God. Remove, Lord God, the hurts even. Remove the frustrations right now and replace it with love, God. Father, thank you that there's a divine exchange happening even at this very moment, Lord God. There's a divine exchange. All our frustrations, all our bitterness and offenses, all our, Lord, unmet expectations, Lord God, are being saturated being clothed, being swept away with your love. Father, we receive afresh of this love today. Lord, thank you. We can actually do this every single day. We can actually look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith every single day. Thank you that you will give grace, that grace to us. Please put your hands down. For those of you who are married, can you please lift up your hand? Father, I pray for those of us here, or all of us here who are married, Lord, we lift up our hands to you. Father, thank you that you have desired for our marriages to honor you. Thank you that we're not doing this alone. Thank you that we are doing this with you. So Jesus, be the Lord of our marriages, God. Jesus, we ask that you would take control, Lord God, of our marriages. Jesus, Lord, we pray and lift up to you our marriages, Lord. Thank you that you will give us the grace. You will give us the wisdom. You will give us the patience. You will give us the joy. You will give us the endurance, Lord. You will give us, Lord God, that selflessness in us. Because it's all a result of your grace. And we receive this, Lord. We declare our marriages or how we conduct in our marriages would glorify and honor you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you all.